Hello and welcome to episode two of my sports and exercise science series. We're going to be following on from episode one by talking about the scope of sports and exercise science in more detail, the careers that a sports and exercise science degree could lead to, and how different sports and exercise disciplines look to improve athletes' performance in sport. Finally, we're going to touch on how the sports and exercise science degree courses typically differ from years one to three at university. Sports and exercise science as a subject encompasses a variety of different disciplines which have grown as the subject has evolved. Whilst the core of the subject consists of biomechanics, physiology, psychology and nutrition, it has also grown to cover the sociology of sport, sports coaching, strength and conditioning, motor control and physical activity and health. Sociology in sport investigates the role sports play in society and how sports have developed into what they've become today. Let's think of football for example. There was once a period in the 1970s and 80s where football hooliganism was at its peak between English football fans. This type of organised football hooliganism now is far less common. Sociology in sport looks at important topics such as racism, sexism, homophobia and drug use in sport. So think of sociology as the study of the development, structure and functioning of human society. Motor control is the branch of psychology that examines how motor skills are acquired, coordinated and controlled. Motor control is a complex process involving the coordinated contraction of muscles due to the transmission of impulses sent from the motor cortex to its motor units. Simply put, it's the process of initiating, directing and grading purposeful voluntary movement. The growth of sports science has fueled the demand for more jobs in the field. Not only are sports teams or athletes looking to improve performance, more recreational, everyday physical fitness participants are too. So what could you look to go into for a job after your degree? Sports biomechanics, sports psychology, sports physiology, performance analysis, sports nutrition, sports coaching, rehabilitation, strength and conditioning or sports massage are all areas that you may look to explore during or after your degree. The demand for exercise specialists has also grown as the general public look for advice on how to improve their fitness. There is also a greater awareness by the general public of how much exercise can benefit both physical and mental well-being. As a result, more graduates are looking to get into careers to be fitness instructors, personal trainers, exercise consultants, health promoters, sports centre managers, gym managers, as well as sports development officers. Finally, an area that is growing is graduates looking to get into teaching or research. Opportunities include becoming a sports science lecturer, physical education teacher, or research scientist. Let's now look at a case study and see how the four main sports and exercise science disciplines approach an athlete's goals differently. Here's Cleo, she's 24, a professional boxer and has fought 10 times. Cleo's unbeaten, she's breathed through county, domestic and European level. However, now she's competing against world level opponents. So she's competing against the best of the best. In the gym, Cleo finds she's making mistakes. She feels jaded, her stats in the gym are regressing she decides to change her coach, but this hasn't had any positive effect. As a last resort, Cleo looks to seek help from sports scientists before fighting top level opponents because she feels that she would get beat. Remember earlier, we spoke about the four main core disciplines of sports science. We spoke about sports psychology, sports physiology, biomechanics, and nutritionists. So how do you think each one of these professions would help Cleo? How would they improve her performance? What questions may they ask Cleo? She's clearly not a bad boxer, she's unbeaten and she's got to world level, but what would they provide her in terms of guidance and support? Let's start with Karen, the sports psychologist. Karen's interested in Cleo's motivation. Has this been negatively affected by something that's happened during training? Is there any difference in Cleo's self-confidence? If so, why and how could this be overcome? Karen would ask Cleo what her goals were, how she thinks she can achieve them and action a plan moving forwards. Karen would also ask Cleo what she thinks is stopping her from achieving her goals 
and investigate why Cleo was statistically declining during her training. For example, why the weights Cleo was lifting are regressing or the run times that she's doing are not so quick. Karen would establish how Cleo responded to these negatives. Does Cleo get upset or does she drive herself to train harder and harder to failure and punish her body negatively? Finally, Karen as a sports psychologist would look at if Cleo was experiencing stress in or out of sport. Is Cleo's personal life okay? Is she feeling anxious, stressed, nervous, or over aroused? All of these emotions could explain why she's making more mistakes than usual. John the sports physiologist would look at Cleo's physical conditioning and if her training was producing the necessary adaptations that are specific for Cleo's sport. He would look at the key movements that are involved in Cleo's sport, such as having sharp reflexes, agile footwork, and having high punch output and power. He would look into if Cleo was able to do these movements successfully. Is she strong enough, fit enough, agile enough? If not, what are the barriers? John would be interested in what is causing Cleo to make mistakes and would look at if Cleo is getting enough rest and adequate recovery. Is Cleo's rest and recovery optimal for training and competition? Now let's move on to Susan, the biomechanist. Susan would be interested in the quality of Cleo's movements and the execution of her punches and footwork. Susan would be looking at tapes of Cleo in training and comparing this to previous fights. Is Cleo moving in the same way? Was Cleo doing anything previously that she's not doing now? What are the limitations in Cleo's movement? And are these causing the mistakes that she's making? Could Cleo's technique be improved to make her faster? stronger and have higher output? Can Cleo be smarter with the movements that she's making to avoid fatigue? Susan would scrutinize any weaknesses in Cleo's overall movement and seek documented improvements. Finally, we have Roberto the nutritionist. Roberto would straight away look at Cleo's diet plan. Is Cleo getting a good balance of carbohydrates, fats and proteins, as well as vitamins and minerals? Alongside this, is Cleo drinking enough water? These areas are key to get right to support Cleo's training schedule. Roberto would look at Cleo's body composition, has it changed recently, and could it be improved for her sport? Roberto would question Cleo on if she eats outside of her diet. Does she snack on things that she shouldn't? Does she skip meals? If she goes out with friends, are they positive or negative in terms of their influence to Cleo? Cleo may not actually have ever bothered with nutrition, hence why she's plateaued. Can you see how all the approaches of all the different disciplines vary in how they would look to help Cleo? A multidisciplinary approach is having a team of individuals working together to cover all bases when analyzing performance. The more information that is gained helps to increase the probability that a successful plan can be put in place for the athlete and the more disciplines that work together on that plan can help to add different opinions on the problem. As a personal trainer myself and having worked with athletes, it's very common for me to work with another discipline to get the best out of an athlete. I'll give you an example. I had a client that was training amazingly well in the gym. Her body composition, however, was not shifting and she was training very hard four times a week for around five hours in that week. She was on a nutritional plan. However, what she didn't tell me was she had a lot of external psychological issues that were beyond my scope as a trainer to rectify. The key principle here is, if something's not quite going right and you suspect that something is beyond your scope of training, you have to say it to the client. Don't be afraid to get someone else on board. It's better that way for yourself so you don't take responsibility of something that you're not trained for. And it's better for the athlete and client so they can resolve the issue. It's common as a trainer to actually get met with resistance from clients when bringing up the topic of bringing someone else in for additional help. If you've built up a relationship with a client, they trust you and they look to you for guidance and information. You may, for example, when bringing up that they may need a sports nutritionist, be met with questions such as, can't you just do that? I don't think that's needed. What if I don't like them? I didn't sign up for that when I started training with you and I don't have the money. In this scenario, which is common, it's important to make the client aware of the benefits and rationale for how this could help the client achieve their goals or overcome an obstacle or barrier that the client is experiencing. 
Finally, in whatever job you do when working with clients, remember not to be too hard on yourself if things don't go to plan. If a client sees you twice a week for an hour, you should be totally in charge of those two hours. After all, that's what they're paying you for. This doesn't mean outside of those two hours, the remaining 166 hours of the week are then also your responsibility. The client has to understand that they're in control of that period. In that hypothetical, two out of 168 hours in the week means that you see them for 1.19% of their week. Let's finish by looking at sports and exercise science at university and the course itself. How does the course evolve from years one to three? When looking at universities, ask what the modules are, look at how the course content differs from each university you visit and let this play a key role in the decision you ultimately make. Do you already know what area of sports and exercise science you're most interested in and is this area covered better at one of the universities that you're going to be going to? Course content can reflect the university's facilities and the expertise of lecturing staff. Year one tends to be more broad in terms of course content and year two and year three become more specialised. In year one, the focus of universities is often one thing and that's to get everyone to the same standard of learning. Why is this important? Well, remember the students enrolling on the courses will come from different A-level choices. You may have mature students on the course. Some may have done national diplomas and BTECs. The university will get to broadly cover sports and exercise science in year one to get everybody to that same standard of learning so everyone's equally prepared for years two and three. By the end of year one, you should have a sound understanding of the following. Anatomy and physiology, sports physiology, biomechanics, sports psychology, how to research and a development in academic style. Academic style involves how to reference, structure work such as essays and reports, evaluating information and selection of appropriate sources. Sometimes students in year one with particular interests switch off from course content they find as not relevant but in later years all the information that you've learned is important because ultimately your lecturer will expect you to know it. It is well known that to enrol on to year two, you need to have passed year one study. This includes exams and coursework. The aim of second year is three things. To extend knowledge on the core subjects of physiology, psychology, biomechanics and nutrition. To give students the chance to specialise in certain subject areas that have a particular interest to the student and finally to offer students a blend of learning that is compulsory and optional. Again this gives the student flexibility and freedom to explore different areas of sports science. After year two you'll have an extended knowledge on the subject as a whole and perhaps you'll know what area you'd like to pursue a career in. You will ultimately be a better researcher and you'll be able to interpret and analyse data better. There may still be compulsory modules in year three, but you'll be offered a greater opportunity for specialization and compulsory modules are reduced. The main focus of year three study is your research project or dissertation. A dissertation is an eight to 10,000 word piece of research selected and conducted by you. This will be the most academically demanding part of your degree and you'll be expected to undertake an experiment in which you analyze and present the findings. Don't feel overwhelmed as you should have a dissertation supervisor and you should be able to talk to them with regards to any questions, concerns or help in regular meetings. Your dissertation is usually the last piece of work submitted and represents six to nine months of hard work and effort. Final exams in year three are often completed before the end of the year to allow students to then focus on their dissertation. That concludes the second episode of my sports and exercise science series. I hope you've enjoyed this episode and don't forget to like and subscribe for more free and educational content. You've been watching UK Fitness Hub. I've been Travis Tarrant and I'll see you soon in the next episode where we'll begin study on the musculoskeletal system.